Hello. My name is Blaine Lilly, and I'm currently a sixth grader from Roosevelt Middle School. Today we are going to talk about happiness. Specifically, what makes people truly happy in life? Before I go any further, would you please bow your heads with me and pray? Heavenly Father, may you open everyone's hearts this morning in order to receive this message. I lift this prayer up in your holy name. Amen. So, today's question is, what makes people truly happy in life? But, before I go any further, I'd like to tell you the five things that make me happy. There may not be the five things that make you happy, but they are the five things that put a smile on Blaine Lily's face. Here we go. Okay, number one, computer. Number two, house. Number three, living in the country. Number four, youth group. And number five, being left-handed. Because it is awesome. <laughs> Show of hands, who here is left-handed? You're awesome, 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 you're awesome. Woo! You guys are awesome. In order to better answer this question, what makes people truly happy in life, we're going to look at a person in the Bible who had a personal quest to find ultimate happiness in his life. The person did all he could to find ultimate happiness. And his name... Funny you should ask. His name was none other than King Solomon. The first thing that King Solomon tried in his quest for ultimate happiness was to be the richest person in the world. King Solomon thought, surely if I have enough money, then I'll be truly happy. So just how rich was King Solomon? Well, he had 12,000 horses to pull his 1,400 chariots all over the place. 10 or 12,000 horses. That's a lot of money. But wait, how much do you think King Solomon made in a year? How much do you think his annual salary was? Turn to a neighbor and tell them how much you think King Solomon made in a year. So, King Solomon tried to be the richest person in the world. How much do you think King Solomon made in a year? His salary was 25 tons of gold. 25 tons of gold per year. 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 27 says that, King Solomon made silver in Jerusalem as common as stones. He was that wealthy. Well, Solomon eventually achieved his goal of becoming the richest person in the world. So, the question is, did Solomon become, did Solomon find his ultimate happiness? Was he truly happy in life? The answer is no. He never had enough. He was never satisfied. Looks like wealth and money, as good as they are, are not the answers to ultimate happiness. You'll never have enough to be satisfied. The next thing that King Solomon tried in his quest for ultimate happiness was to be the smartest person in the world. He thought, well, if I'm smart enough, if I have enough wisdom, then surely I'll be truly happy. So just how smart was King Solomon? The scriptures tell us that he could teach anyone about almost anything. King Solomon was so smart, he wrote over 1,000 proverbs. And, no, 1,000 songs and 3,000 proverbs. Many of which are in our Bible today. People all over came from People all over the place came to learn about Solomon's wisdom. 1 Kings 
chapter 4, verse 34, says that men of all nations came to listen to Solomon's wisdom. Well, Solomon eventually achieved his goal of becoming the smartest person in the world. The question is, was the smartest and wisest person in the world truly happy in life? Did Solomon find his ultimate happiness? The answer is no. He never had enough. He never knew enough. He was never satisfied. At this point, King Solomon was desperate. He was willing to do anything to find out what would make him truly happy in life. The next thing he tries is to be famous. Perhaps if he's popular enough, perhaps if enough people knew about him, then he would be truly happy. After all, uh, after over some time, King Solomon's name became well known throughout the kingdom. After all, he was the smartest person in the world and the richest person in the world. King Solomon was so famous that the most important people in the world sought out for his advice. Was being famous and popular the key to having happiness in your life? The answer is is no. King Solomon tried it and he found out it wasn't the answer. He was never famous enough. He was never satisfied. The last thing that King Solomon tried to achieve in his life was the most interesting of them all. After all, desperate times call for desperate measures, right? King Solomon decided that he finally figured out the secret to happiness. And that was get in the ladies. <laughs> King Solomon thought if he was hitting home runs with the ladies of Jerusalem, then he'd surely he'd discover ultimate happiness. First Kings chapter eleven, verse three says that King Solomon had seven hundred wives and three hundred concubines. Fun fact having seven hundred wives is not the answer to ultimate happiness. <laughs> Sounds more like a formula for misery. And 300 concubines. I don't even know what a concubine is. <laughs> but I'm guessing it's really not that good. After all these things that King Solomon tried, being wealthy, being famous, being smart, Solomon ended up being empty, unsatisfied, and a broken man. One might say that King Solomon was as far away from happiness as you could get. So, if wealth, knowledge, and being famous aren't the answer to happiness, then what is? What is the formula for happiness? To answer this question, let's look up on the following screens. What's something everyone wants every day that can't be bought but can be found? And when you find it, you can lose it. But if you share it, you get more of it. The answer? Happiness. And everyone has a formula for finding it. A lot of people say, me plus job plus a house plus a family equals happy. It's the classic American dream. But for a teenager, the formula's more simple. Me plus a car equals happy. Then there's the nature lover formula. Me plus a backpack minus civilization equals happy. The sports fan says, me plus my team plus the number one draft pick equals happy. And for the millionaire, it's me plus money plus even more money equals happy. The problem with these formulas is that other stuff messes with the equation. The millionaire meets a billionaire. Oh, yeah. The sports fan starts losing. The nature lover runs into a mother bear and her cubs. The teenager's formula gets way more complicated. And lately, the American dream hasn't been so dreamy. People have lost jobs and lost homes. Families are crumbling under the strain, and more people than ever are wondering, is there some other formula out there that can make me happy again? There is, but you won't find it out there. You'll find it in here. And it looks like this. J plus O plus Y. First up is J, the guy you need to know, the grace you need to accept, the God you need to put first. Next is O, the people you need to love, 
the friends you need to serve. And finally comes you, the you that trusts, the you that prays, the you that finally realizes I'm not the center of, the head of, or the butt of the universe. The you that likes cars, jobs, houses, nature, money, and every other good thing, but doesn't need them because you've already found the thing that can't be bought. You already share the thing that can't be kept. And you know the God who wrote the formula for happiness. I hope that as you pursue true happiness in your life, you decide to be filled with joy that can only happen through having Jesus Christ in your heart. If we prioritize having a relationship with Jesus Christ ahead of everything else, and if we choose to serve and love others in God's name, then I believe we will find the kind of joy that was mentioned in the video. Whatever your recipe is for happiness, if God isn't the first part of it and the biggest part of it, then it isn't really a recipe for happiness, is it? May you choose to fill your life with Jesus Christ, and as a result, find your life filled with joy, happiness, and purpose. Would you please bow your heads and pray with me? Heavenly Father, may you give us all a willing spirit to welcome Jesus to be in our lives. I pray today that we all make Jesus the most important part of our lives, and that everything we do and say reflects that decision. Thank you, God, for allowing us to find true happiness and purpose in our lives when we center on your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Morning, everybody. Uh, for those of you who don't know, my name is Mark Dold. I'm currently a, a sophomore at Twin Lakes High School. But before I begin my message this morning, I'd like to ask that you can all just bow your heads in a quick word of prayer. Dear God, I thank you so much for uh, gathering oh so many people and here this morning to love and praise you and worship your name. Father, I pray that as I deliver your message this morning, and it's not really my words that I speak, God, but it's your words and you're speaking through me, Father. Lord, I pray that you can convict everyone's hearts in this sanctuary. You can just thoroughly convict us and then uh, not stop there, but give us the courage and the strength that we need to respond to that conviction. God, I thank you so much. I pray this all of these things in your glorious, glorious name. Amen. So I don't know how many uh, sports fans there are in the building this morning, but I myself am a pretty big sports fan. In fact, I love basketball. I just love to play it. I love to watch it. It's great. And so I was wondering, uh, by a show of hands, how many of you guys watched the NCAA championship game uh, last Monday? Okay, one, okay, more than one, quite a few. Um, that's awesome. Um, well, so was I. I was, I was uh, watching it on Monday, and I'm sitting there watching this game, and I'm thinking to myself, basketball is great. And, and everything with basketball just seems to be a little bit better, uh, for me at least. Um, and so, I was like, you know what I should do? I should speak about basketball. I had this great idea. I should make my sermon great, fun, right? Um, and God, I think, provided me with an awesome uh, basketball analogy. But... It's too big for me. Uh, so, so I'm going to need help from two people in the crowd this morning. Steve McKinley and uh, Pete Crow. There you are. Could you guys join me on stage for a sec? Don't shake your head, Pete. You know you want to be up here. Thanks, guys. Steve-O, can I, can I have you stand right here? You, you get to be player one today. Don't worry. It'll be okay. No, no, actually... <laughs> You know what? I guess I'll promote you to player two. No, 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 no. Be player two. Be player two. Pete, you, you can come over here. No, you come up on the step with me. Join me. Join me up here. You can be tall. You can be tall. Yeah, yeah. Go for it. Yeah, all the way up. No, not back there. That's the band. <laughs> um, so I was watching the game, you know, last uh, Monday. And, and I know it was the end of the tournament, but I kind of want to rewind to the back of the tournament here. Uh, so say it's the very start of the tournament. We've got our two players here. Uh, let's say that they're basketball players. On the same team, all right, teammates, they're on, they're on the best team, though. They, they've, they are projected to win by a long shot, and they have got the best coach in the entire league, like John Wooden, but better. And um, so it's, it's Tuesday, and they play on Monday, so they got a whole week of practice. But as Bobby Knight once said, this is not, don't, don't, no Bobby Knight, can I just maybe 
throw this stand. He said, well, he, he said, it's not practice that makes perfect. It's perfect practice that makes perfect. And so I, I want to see how these two guys, I want to look at their week of practice. Right, Pete? All righty. So, so, so player one over here, he's the guy in the interviews. It's like, it's talking about practice. It doesn't really matter. And, and, and so he's late to practice. And, and when he does finally decide to show up to practice, he's like dragging his feet. He's got no effort, hardly. And, and then the coach, he hardly listens to the guy. He's like a dinosaur, maybe. So it's just, who cares about what he has to say? But player one, not a very good start. But player, player two, unfortunately, he's much better. He's going to help the team out a bit. See, see he is not just uh, to practice on time. He's there early, you know, get mentally prepared, get his free throws down, get in the zone. Yeah, get the free throws, get your rhythm. Yeah, he, he's getting ready. And, and, and effort, this guy gives 120% effort, 100% of the time. He's going all out every second. And, and he realizes that the coach is smart. So he doesn't just listen to the coach in practice. He, he takes the scouting report and he reads over, you know, every line, you know, every player. He, he, he goes through it with a, with a fine-tooth comb. And, and I think it's going to make a big difference. And in fact, it does. Because come game time, quite a shock to player one, not a shock to us. But player two is the one that gets the start. He, he, he's up there, he's playing, and in fact, he's got a great game. He, he, he kick-starts his team's journey in the, in the tournament. He, it, it's just a great start. Couldn't have gone any better. Player one over there, he's sitting on the bench, though. He, he hardly gets maybe five, ten minutes. And he's sitting there, and he's thinking to himself, you know, well, where did I go wrong? Uh, I've got skill, you know, he's athletic. I, I, I've got on the best team, awesome teammates, and, and I've got the best coach in the league right now. Well, why am I sitting here on the bench? What did I, what, how did I mess up? And what, what he doesn't realize is, it, it's not those things that we talked about earlier, those three things. It, it's so much more than that. He, he didn't give the coach anything, so the coach had nothing to work with. And so I want to think for a second, what if we were the player? And we got to choose between being player one or player two. And God was our coach. How would we respond to God? Would we give him the effort that we need? Would we, uh, would we show up to practice on time? Would we read the scouting reports? I really want you to think about that. Let's give these guys a round of applause, though, as they head back to your seats. Thank you, guys. So I was sitting there Monday thinking about that. But I realized, you know, I'm going to be in church, so I better sprinkle in a little bit of God with the, with the basketball. <laughs> and so I found this story of a guy in the Bible. His name was Joseph. And he was the 11th son uh, of 12, so he's got 10 older brothers, so, you know, they're way older than him. But just because he's, the, he's the, the just young, it, it doesn't mean he's, he, he's, you know, not favored by the father. In fact, he's daddy's golden boy. Joseph cannot do wrong. He is on top. He, he's loving life. But his brothers, on the other hand, get so jealous of him. They, they, they wish that they had that favoritism that Joseph had. And, and it's out of this jealousy and this, this, this you know, hatred for their brother that he spirals down. Uh, and and he, he gets his first low. He gets his first low in a, a very roller coaster life that Joseph has. And, and in one day, he's, he's approaching his brothers in the field. And the, by the time he gets to them, they throw him in a well with no water in the bottom of it. So first off, that's got to hurt. But then they only pull him out to sell him into slavery. And guys, this is his own flesh and blood. These are his brothers selling him off into slavery for 20 pieces of silver. And, and it's, it's, a, it's a new low for, for Joseph. But he chooses to persevere. He chooses to be like player two. And, and, and he works hard, and he gets sold into a man named Potiphar's household. It's a pretty nice house, but he's a lowly servant. But he works his way up to being second in command. He's in charge of like his entire estate. He's the guy that's directing people what to do. He is like large and in charge and loving life. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> but uh, the devil sees this, and he doesn't like it. He's not going to let it last for very long. So he, he works it out that Joseph gets accused uh, of a crime, a crime that Joseph didn't even do. But he's a slave. His opinion doesn't matter. He has no testimony. And he gets thrown back into an all-new low. Joseph is thrown into a prison. And not just any prison, the king's 
prison. Life sentence. There's no way he's ever going to get out of this thing. And this is where Joseph has to really choose. What is he going to do? He's been up. He's been down. He's been up. He's been down. I mean, he's been on this ride for a while now. He's, you'd think he's starting to get tired. And now he has a choice on whether he really wants to persevere or whether he just gives up. And he chooses to say, you know what, God? I have faith in you. And I don't care if I have to climb that hill a thousand times. I will keep climbing, God, because you are right there climbing with me. And he begins to climb. And, uh, and uh, he eventually he becomes the head of this entire prison. Uh, he, he, he goes from being a prisoner in shackles to in charge of the whole prison running the thing. And then God says, you know what? I'm not going to stop there. Because of your perseverance, keep going. Keep climbing to the top. And he gets all the way to the top. He's the king of Egypt. Like the entire nation. He, he is second in command only to Pharaoh himself. He, he, is, he is literally now Potiphar. He's in charge of Potiphar. He is, that's how much power he has now. And he also has an awesome relationship with God. So he has true happiness, just like Blaine said. And what I loved about this story was that Joseph had no, he had every reason to turn back, and he had no reason to push forward. Yet for some reason, Joseph finds it within himself to, to dig deep and keep going and, and, and finish the race. And he does a great job of it. And see, I want to look within ourselves to see if, if we are doing that. Because we are like the players. We're like Joseph. And we have that same choice that Joseph had. Choice between player one, choice between player two. And I want you to ask yourself this morning, how are you doing in those areas? Are you, are you showing up to God's practices? I'm not talking about church. I'm talking like every morning, waking up and deciding to live for God. Or are you giving God all of you 100%, not just like 70 or maybe 80%, but 100%? Are you giving that to God? And then finally, God realizes that, that we are in more than a basketball game. We are in a war with the enemy. And he realizes it's a pretty tough enemy. And so he gives us the best scouting report, the best battle strategy you could ever hope for. And that is his word. Are we even reading it? I want you guys to ask yourselves that this morning. Um, at this time, if you could pull, take out your bulletin and pull out the uh, pinkish, reddish salmon color uh, card. I don't know really what to call it. And um, on that card, it's, it's got player one on one side, player ten on the other. And, and, and I want you to think, how are you, how are you doing on those? Uh, and how are you living for God? And I want you to th think about that, and I want you to circle a number on the scale of 1 to 10 on how you're doing. Put a, put a nice big circle around it. And after you put your circle, I also want you to think, where do you want to be? Not by the end of your lifetime, but like say in the next week, the next two months maybe. Where do you want to be with those winning ways? With that listening to God, set a goal for yourself. And I want you to put a square around that circle on the number of where you want to be in two months. And, you're, and when you put a square around that, you're committing to thinking and, and really praying about it and working with God to go there. Because, see, I believe we're on a journey. A journey like Joseph's journey throughout all of his life. A journey with ups and a journey with downs. A roller coaster journey. And I believe that we have that same choice to choose whether or not we want to live more purposefully and passionately for God. And guys, I hope that there are people in this building this, uh, this morning whose squares are higher than their circles, who want to choose to start living that kind of life for God. And I, and I pray that by the end of today is over, I hope that you get that opportunity to show God, not, not with not with your words, and not with a square on a piece of paper, but show God with your actions that you want to start living that kind of life, and you want to begin that type of journey, the same journey that Joseph took. It's a hard choice to make, but I think when we make it, it's really worth it. Ben Lila, would you join me up on stage? 
Oh, wait. Hold up. You guys go back. I'm sorry. I forgot one thing. You can stay up here. But um, I forgot one thing real quick. I'm sorry. Um, actually, you can go back to your seat real quick. My bad. <laughs> I, I skipped ahead. My apologies. I got excited. There's a lot more people here this service. Um, can, can we turn your attention to the screen real quick um, and look at this uh, piece of scripture? It's Colossians 1 verse 10. And it says, uh, And we pray this, in order that, y- that you may live a life worthy of the Lord, and that you may please Him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, and growing in the knowledge of God. We pray this as a church, that we can make that choice to, to live that life worthy of God, worthy of such an amazing, awesome coach, that we can please Him. And, and in doing so, we can bear fruit in every way, in every single area of our lives. And and when we read God's perfect scouting report, we can grow in in His glorious knowledge. Because it it really is great. And now, Blaine, would you join me on the stage? Thanks, buddy. Blaine, (laughs) what you did this morning... Uh, when, when you spoke, and also when you spoke this service, it took a lot of guts, buddy. It took a lot of courage, a lot of faith. And I think that you really stood up for God. You went from sitting down and you stood. You made those choices like player two. I think you set a great example, but Blaine, I think that is just the beginning. I think that as you continue through middle school and eventually high school, Blaine, you're going to be great and you're going to be on fire for God. You really are. Thanks, buddy. And I want you to remember, this kid's 12 years old. He's in sixth grade. If he can stand up for God, why can't we? Why, why, why can't we make that choice? I believe we can. Go ahead back to your seat, Blaine. See, I believe that we can, that we can together, as a church, make the choice to be strong, and to make the choice to be courageous, to persevere, to show up to God's practices. And I especially believe that this community that we're living in, all this community needs is a church, a church willing to shine the light of God. All this community needs is a spark. It'll be lit on fire for God. It'll be so beautiful, the amount of people who are passionately serving God. And all it takes is that one choice. For all the youth up there in the balcony and down here, I just want to tell you guys, it doesn't matter how old you are. As Blaine proved this morning, all that matters is that you're standing up for God. Is that you're choosing to live for God. When you're at school, when you're at home, when you're with your friends, and when you're by yourself. That you're choosing to live passionately for God. And and adults, just hear me out for one second here. My generation and all the kids, we're looking up to you. And we need you to be that example. We need you to be that, that light. We need you to stand up and be the example that hundreds can follow. I believe that it's there. I want to give you guys an opportunity this morning to stand for Christ. Not with your words or with your intentions. They're good intentions. I feel like a lot of us are good intentions, but we need to prove it with our actions. So if you feel God nudging in your heart this morning, I want you to go ahead and just stand up for God. I'm looking for people that are willing to commit to standing for God. I'm looking for people that are willing to live that kind of lifestyle. And I thank God so much. So many people are making that choice. And that choice is going to last. Hopefully for the rest of your lives. I I believe that we're going to do great things as a church. I believe that so many people are going to be affected. And I praise God for that. I just pray that we can never forget 
what, what, what we've got in this moment. God, I pray that you can set a, a blazing fire in the very fiber of our beings, a fire that is, that, that is deep in our soul, that we can't even hope to just keep it inside of us, but it spreads outside of us, outside of the walls of this church, everywhere, God. God, I pray that we can do this with more of you and less of us. Lord, I pray this in your glorious name. Amen.